Hello, everybody, and welcome back to iOS C140 Human Physiology. This is the S3C1 video, part two. We're going to cover how blood cells are created. Where do they come from? So this is an important question for a number of reasons. It definitely has a lot of healthcare implications. There's a lot of healthcare issues that come up related to the production of blood cells. Blood cells, red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets, mature ones cannot just divide and create a new one of them. So mature red blood cells cannot just divide and create two red blood cells. Mature red blood cells don't have nuclei. They don't have the machinery required for that process. RNA will do it either, and same with platelets. They need to come from a special tissue that will then produce cells that mature into the, these various cells. Red blood cells, white blood cells, platelets. So red blood cells come from red bone marrow. White blood cells come from red bone marrow. And a few of them, the agranulocytes, can come from the lymphatic tissue, from lymph tissue. Uh, the agranulocytes, we'll get into those when we talk specifically about white blood cells. So that'll make more sense later on. Platelets also come from red bone marrow. Now, within that red bone marrow, there's a special type of cell called the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. Know this term, know this, this word right here. Um, it's an important one, and I have used it in test questions before. So you do want to know it. Uh, pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. Pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. This word this cell right here. It's what gives rise to erythrocytes. It's what gives rise to platelets. And it's what gives rise to white blood cells. All blood cells are derived from a single progenitor, and that progenitor is the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell. Hematopoiesis is the synthesis of blood cells. So this process is hematopoiesis, the synthesis of blood cells. And that's our main focus for this part two video, hematopoiesis, the synthesis of blood cells. So we have our pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell in red bone marrow. How does it know to become a red blood cell? Well, it knows to become a red blood cell because it gets exposed to a hormone. It gets a signal from a hormone called erythropoietin. Erythropoietin. EPO for short. Know the abbreviation. It's important. EPO is produced in the kidneys, and it's produced when the kidneys detect low levels of O2. So it makes sense. The kidneys detect low levels of O2. They say, oh, we need more oxygen in the blood stream. So let's release some erythropoietin. That erythropoietin is going to go tell the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cells in our red bone marrow to become an erythrocyte. So one signal, erythropoietin, that pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell, goes down a path of maturation, which leads it to becoming an erythrocyte. Now, there's a number of implications of this. So low oxygen levels stimulate EPO production. Red blood cells increase the amount of oxygen that we can carry in our, red, in our, in our bloodstream. Athletes get an advantage by being able to have a, more oxygen in their bloodstream. 
So athletes will go to high altitude places where there's a lower partial pressure of oxygen in the atmosphere in order to stimulate more EPO production and therefore stimulate more red cell production. So athletes will go up to Mammoth, up in the Sierras, or up to Tahoe, or up to the mountains in Colorado, and will train at high altitude in order to stimulate more EPO production, which stimulates more red cell production. With modern medicine, we have developed synthetic EPO also. So if you really don't like Colorado and you want to stay by the beach in San Francisco, but you want the benefits, you can take synthetic EPO. Synthetic EPO. Now, there's been a lot of issues with this. Uh, synthetic EPO is not considered uh, all right to take by most athletic governing boards. And it's caused some issues, even at the highest level of athletics. So in 2002, at the Salt Lake Olympics, uh, you know, this person won three gold medals and then tested positive after winning the first two for synthetic EPO. Uh, originally, last one was taken away for synthetic EPO. Later, all golds were taken away from this person. Uh, so this person tested positive for taking synthetic EPO and had his gold medals taken away. Uh, more than 100 athletes tested positive that year at the Olympics. So it's, it's an issue. Thrombopoietin creates platelet-producing cells. So thrombopoietin, you know, similar word to erythropoietin, makes it easy to remember. Thrombopoietin creates platelet-producing cells. So those platelet-producing cells are going to be megakaryocytes. So thrombopoietin goes and tells pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell, you should become platelets. And the pluripotent hematopoietic stem cell says, okay, and it undergoes a maturation process, which turns it into something called a megakaryocyte. That megakaryocyte then fragments, and all those fragments become platelets. Platelets are cell fragments from a megakaryocyte. Another thing I want to point out, one signal. Thrombopoietin, one signal, one message. Pluripotent vitrophoic stem cell becomes like karyocyte, which becomes the platelets. Leukocytes involve production, sorry, leukocyte production involves two chemical signals. So for red blood cell, one, platelets, one, two different signals in order for this pluripotent myocardic stem cell to become a white blood cell. First one is leukopoietin. It's the generic message. It goes to the pluripotent blood of stem cell and says, hey, you should become a white blood cell. And the pluripotent blood of stem cell says, okay, I will become a white blood cell. And it starts the maturation process. After this maturation process has started, it's going to get another signal called colony stimulating factor, or CSF. And that's going to help determine what specific subtype it becomes. It receives the colony, colony stimulating factor signal and it becomes neutrophil, monocyte, basophil, eosinophil. It becomes that specific type of white blood cell. So two signals, leukopoietin, colony stimulating factor. Bone marrow produces three times more white than red blood cells. So if you remember back to part one of S3P1 video series, in one unit of blood, we have far more red blood cells than we do white blood cells. Now this slide is telling us that we produce more white blood cells then we do red blood cells. This confuses students often. So please let me, I'm gonna to try to explain exactly where students get mixed up here. 
If you're still confused in five minutes, let me know, send me an email. I'm just letting you know this is a, this is a spot where students often miss points. So you take one unit of blood, you're gonna have far more red cells in that unit of blood than you do white blood cells. If you look at the rate at which these cells are produced, the rate of red cell production, the rate of white cell production, there is a higher rate of production for white blood cells than there are red blood cells. This difference is because of the lifespan of the cells. Red blood cells live for three to four months, 90 to 120 days. Red blood cells live for 90 to 120 days, three to four months. White blood cells, most of them live for minutes to hours. Most of them don't live for very long at all. Some can live for a lifetime, but most live for a very short period of time. And it's because of this short lifespan that we need to produce so many white blood cells. So within one unit of blood, we have far more red blood cells than white blood cells at a given time. If you look at the rate of production though, you produce three white blood cells for every one red blood cell. And that's that, that difference that we see there between presence and production, it's because of the lifespan. Red blood cells live for three to four months. White blood cells most live for a very short time. Only a few live for a long time. Here's your summary chart. Again, always pay attention to summary charts. They really help you focus in on what I like, like question, what I like to ask questions on, and what I want you to get out of this lecture. So this is the end of the part two video. Please email me if you have any questions at all, and have a fantastic.